My guest today believes schools as we know them are obsolete, that exams shut down the brain, that children learn best when left alone with computers, and that the best teachers are not education professionals, but grannies who simply say, that's amazing, how, how did you do that? Sugata Mitra is the professor of educational technology at Newcastle University. In 2013, he was awarded the Million Dollar TED Prize to help build a school in the cloud, a creative online space where children from all over the world can gather to answer big questions. Though Sugata Mitra now lives in Gateshead, he was brought up in Delhi, and his work with children in the slums there was very much the inspiration for the Oscar-winning film Slumdog Millionaire. I wonder if you could begin, Professor Mitra, by explaining how this all started. Uh, actually, it was a hole in the wall, really, wasn't it? The way it uh, happened was uh, almost accidental. I was uh, teaching people how to build computing systems, you know, programming and systems development and that kind of thing in uh, a company, NIIT, in uh, Delhi. It's a very large education company. These were rich people's children, effectively. They were paying a lot of money. Next door to my office was a big, sprawling urban slum. And it did trouble me that those children were not getting the opportunity that my students were getting. And around that time, 1999, the personal computer had just about come in. They were very expensive, two or three months' salary. But uh, the few of my rich friends who did have personal computers started saying something rather strange. They said, you know, my little girl, I think she's gifted. So I would say... Why do you think so? Well, the other day I was, uh, you know, doing something on my computer and I couldn't quite figure out a couple of things. When my little girl came and said, oh, this is how you do it. You know, do you think she's gifted? What should I do? And I heard this kind of story from not one, but from many. So I thought to myself, uh, the children of all these rich people are all becoming gifted. That doesn't seem to make much sense. Could it be that there's a special relationship between children and computers? And I thought, well, if there is this special relationship, it should be there with every child. It's just that those children in the slum don't have a computer. Is there a way I can give them one? The only thing I could think of was a stretch of wall which separated the slum from my office. And I said, OK, I'm going to make a rectangular opening in that wall, put a glass pane on that opening, and then stick the computer's monitor from behind and put the rest of the computer on my side of the wall. I'll put a touchpad on the wall on their side and I'll connect it to the internet and then we'll see what happens. What actually happened has been documented over and over again. Within eight hours, the children were browsing and teaching each other how to browse. But how? They hadn't seen a computer before. Remember, this is 1999. They didn't know what the internet was. They didn't know any English, what was going on. And everybody said, oh, your students, you know, they must have been passing by. They showed them how to use the touchpad. So I repeated the experiment hundreds of miles away from Delhi and saw the same results again and again and again. And I was forced to conclude that the children were learning not from any human being. They were learning from something else. When you run into something like that, you cannot leave it until you know what that something else is. I'm still looking. <laughs> One of the things you discovered immediately and particularly fascinating for us on this programme was that children were using the computers to make music. Yes, um, they would play music using electronic keyboards, which you can download for free, and all kinds of other audio things that you can download for free. And they would enjoy doing that, and I thought, well... There's no other way they could have gotten to this. Your first music today, appropriate enough, Bridges East and West, and I think it comes from a time when you uh, had just left India. The first time I left India was in a postdoctoral fellowship. Uh, I think I was about 26, and 
the place I went to was Vienna. And just before I had left, my father had bought this uh, long-playing album, LPs as they were called, mm. called East Meets West. And it was uh, Ravi Shankar and uh, Yehudi Menuhin playing together. I bought a copy of that album and I gave it to my professor, who used to love Bach. And he, he kind of listened and he said, this is different. It's very East. And I said, but it's also a bit West. <laughs> and he said, yes, yes, it is both, isn't it?
That was Swara Kakali, a raga by Ravi Shankar, whom we heard performing with Menuhin from their collaboration, West Meets East. Uh, when you began to see the results of your hole-in-the-wall experiment, Professor Mitra, how much did that discovery challenge your ideas about education? Because after all the time, as I suggested, you were earning a living as a teacher, in fact, at a private college. Yes, I was surprised and I began to ask myself, who taught them? And it took many years to find out that nobody did. It's very hard for a teacher to come to that conclusion. Bark next, and it's a piece that I think probably appeals to the physicist in you. Uh, you began, didn't you, by studying physics. It's the so-called crab canon, where the musical line's a perfect palindrome, the same backwards as forwards. It runs for less than, than a minute, and maybe if we've got a second afterwards, we'll play a bit backwards just to see. But it really is a, a kind of perfectly formed creation, isn't it? It is, absolutely. I, I couldn't believe it when I first encountered it. And I said, but how could he have written that? Did he plan it that way or did it just come out that way? Well, he's not around to ask. Let's hear a snatch of it backwards. Of course, if I were to ask the musicians simply to play it properly, it would sound absolutely perfect. Uh, the way we're going to do it is cheating a bit because we're going to play the tape backwards just to see if it fits. But it, it's quite an interesting experiment. Here it is. It's yeah. absolutely incredible. It's, it's nature playing a joke on us, <laughs> using Bach. It's <laughs> Shiva laughing. That was the first canon from Bach's musical offering, both forwards and backwards, although in this case that's the same thing, <laughs> with soloists from the Academy of St. Martin in the Fields. Uh, as you said, you spent a lot of time discovering how children learn, Professor Mitra, and I think your own childhood was rather extraordinary because your father was one of the first Freudian psychoanalysts in India, and so I imagine all kinds of patients passed through the house. My mother and I used to often open the door when the doorbell rang. My father's instructions were not to talk to the people that came in, but to simply show them to his room. We did not follow his instruction. My mother was very fond of talking to them. <laughs> and she would talk to them for a minute or so. How are you today? And you're looking nice and everything. And then uh, she would uh, show him to my father's study and then turn around to me and say, that's a paranoid schizophrenic if I've ever seen one. <laughs> <laughs> now, this next music um, has actually a connection with your mother. It's a setting of love poetry by the great Bengali poet Tagore. Uh, and I think she knew him as a child. Yes, uh, it's an interesting piece of history. 
my maternal grandfather my mother's father was chief engineer of the assam bengal cement company uh, in what is now bangladesh and tagore called him and said uh, you know i don't have any water tagore had just won the nobel prize and he was building a university in shanti niketan a place about 80 kilometers away from calcutta very beautiful but very dry so tagore said i i need to find water there because otherwise nothing will work and my grandfather landed up there and i don't know how he found water but he found water anyhow my grandfather was there for a while he built the first revolving stage i think in the world for tagore in shantiniketan using motors and electricity and what have you this was i guess the 1920s or 30s my mother used to study there and uh, she's actually sat on tagore's lap and listen to him recite well this is a poem about unrequited love can you tell us a little bit about the lyrics it's a song that i bumped into many years ago it's written in a language called bhojpuri which is a language spoken in northern india tagore apparently wrote it when he was 15 the song itself says effectively that the only elixir of life that we have on this planet is death madanare tu ho mama sha Sava 
the love poetry of Rabindranath Tagore. And all the details of Sugata Mitra's choices are on the private passions page of the Radio 3 website, where you'll be glad to hear, Professor Mitra, that you can download many past editions of the programme as well as this one. Of course, we take all that for granted now, downloading from the internet. But, of course, you've taken it much further by building this school in the cloud. Tell me how that will work. The hole-in-the-wall experiment, which was done in the late 90s in India, travelled, of all places, to Gateshead, England, with me, where the children of Gateshead converted it into what we now call a soul, S-O-L-E, or a self-organised learning environment. In my more romantic moments, I would say it travelled from the Ganges to the Tyne. <laughs> <laughs> and having become a self-organised learning environment, it, it kind of spread virally all around the world with teachers trying it, because it's really very simple. You take a group of children, take a few computers, not as many as children, about one computer to every four or five, uh, connect uh, computers to the internet and ask them a big question, a really, really big one. Um, when did the world begin? How and when will it end? Something like that. And then you just leave them alone. And the hole in the wall happens inside that classroom. Is there a point where we have to draw a line, for example, bullying online or grooming or whatever or pornography? How do we do that if we're giving great freedom, which I sense you believe in? Well, I found a very simple way or a very simple principle. When children are in groups, you know, boys and girls, and four, five, six, seven of them, their activities are different from when they're alone. It's almost impossible to see a group of heterogeneous children looking at pornography on a computer screen that is publicly visible. So that's the other point, that the computer screens should be publicly visible to everybody who is around. This gives us a kind of social control that is far stronger than any piece of software would. I think the trouble that we ask for is of giving children tiny screens and then leaving them alone with those. The, the, the group is safer. Yes, absolutely. Mm. And this process is helped a lot by a, a friendly but not necessarily knowledgeable adult, such as a grandmother, a non-threatening figure, who says, my goodness, how did you do that? And Where on earth did you find that from? What does downloading mean? That sort of thing. Very different, really, from school. But for lack of a better word, I did have to use the word school. But then it's a school that's kind of immersed inside the Internet. Hence the name, the school in the cloud. Can anyone become a, a volunteer in this uh, well, the wonderful scheme you developed of grannies? Yes, we call it the granny cloud. <laughs> and, you know, it, it consists not just of women, not just of uh, grandmothers, but of men, women. The youngest granny I have is a 16-year-old boy. So what do the grannies do? I'll tell you what they do not do. They do not teach. It's bad enough to have a real-life teacher. It's even worse to have one on Skype, let me tell you that. So the grannies merely converse. They'll say, hello, children, so what's going on? And the children will say, we have a religious festival coming up. Um, and the granny would say, what's that? Oh, it's called holy. And what do you do? Oh, we put color on each other. Oh, my God, says the granny, really, that must be fun. What's the purpose of such a conversation? It changes the children's accents. It changes their listening comprehension. And it changes their English in absolutely dramatic ways. Well, we'll also put a link on the Private Passions page for anyone who's interested. Next, um, music uh, from your youth, when you were, as you put it, uh, well, should we say, experimenting with alternative reality, <laughs> despite attending a very strict Jesuit school in Delhi, or perhaps because of. These were the late 1960s. Everybody was talking about alternative reality. So, yes, we did. We experimented with everything. We experimented with 
yoga and, and breathing exercises and LSD and marijuana and uh, whatever we could think of. At the same time, I was in the middle of my postgraduate in physics. We had just entered the world of quantum mechanics and chaos theory and that sort of thing, particularly a subject called quantum electrodynamics. And uh, let me tell you, uh, it beats LSD hands <laughs> down. <laughs> well, uh, we've got some music from that period, which kind of sums it up in some ways. It's a collaboration between two musicians, Alan Parsons and Eric Wolfson. And interestingly enough, it's, this was a, one of those well, the marvelous meetings. They met in the canteen of the Abbey Road Studios in 1974, and uh, the Alan Parsons project was born. No Future in the Past from the album Time Machine by the Alan Parsons Project. We were something of a rebel in your youth, Sugata Mitra. No. <laughs> but you like shaking things up now. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, the theme of this year's free thinking is tearing up the rule book. And I would say you fit it uh, rather well because you've made us rethink our approach to education and you'd like to see us, um, to a certain extent, overturn previous concepts and look at these new ones. I suppose so. My father used to smoke uh, cigars 
and and those cigars used to be in some lovely wooden cigar boxes quite recently i found one of the old cigar boxes it didn't have any cigars in it but it had little model aeroplanes that i had whittled out of wood when i was i think about 8 or 9 and you know i felt a little nostalgic looking at those below the aeroplanes i found a piece of paper it was a letter it turned out to be a letter written by me to myself and it says when you grow up i hope you keep thinking like i do <laughs> well let me give you an example of how you are tearing up the rule book you hate exams i dislike them because they finished their usefulness you know they have outlived their usefulness mm. they were useful in a world of just in case education where children were taught all sorts of things just in case if you need it one day because you couldn't have carried your library with you you couldn't have carried the whole knowledge of the entire humanity uh, on your back so in order for you to learn that sort of just in case education you had to be tested before your education was complete to check whether you remembered all of those things that's where exams were useful but we don't need just in case education anymore i think the only person in the world who is likely to need just in case education would be robinson crusoe or something like that we are not isolated like that we carry the entire human consciousness in our pockets we don't think of it that way <laughs> so um Uh, we've got a lovely irony coming up which i'm sure will not be lost on you which is uh, although we don't want to in your world uh, push memorizing for its own sake we are in fact going to hear a poem next and one that you learned by heart as a child i think yes i did not learn it by heart my brain decided to remember it this is byron uh, byron became my favorite poem and uh, I read everything that he had written. Of all of those, the prisoner of Shillon appealed to me only because of one paragraph inside the whole thing, where this guy who is, uh, you know, imprisoned, loses all sense of time and loses all all sense of space. And uh, well, I mean, you'll hear it, but uh, he. he talks about there there were no stars no earth no time no check no change no good no crime you know and uh, and i thought yes i can i can do that you know all you have to do is close your eyes and stop your thoughts and you can be there what next befell me then and there i know not well i never knew first came the loss of light and air and then of darkness too i had no thought no feeling none among the stones i stood a stone and was scarce conscious what i wist a shrubless crags within the mist for all was blank and bleak and gray it was not night it was not day it was not even the dungeon light so hateful to my heavy sight but vacancy absorbing space and fixedness without a place There were no stars, no earth, no time, no check, no change, no good, no crime, but silence and a stirless breath, which neither was of life nor death, a sea of stagnant idleness, blind, boundless, mute, and motionless. A light broke in upon my brain. It was the carol of a bird. It ceased, and then it came again. The sweetest song ear ever heard. and mine was thankful till my eyes ran over with the glad surprise and they that moment could not see i was the mate of misery but then by dull degrees came back my senses to their wonted track i saw the dungeon walls and floor close slowly round me as before i saw the glimmer of the sun creeping as it before had done but through the crevice where it came that bird was perched as fond and tame and tamer than upon the tree a lovely bird with azure wings and song that said a thousand things and seemed to say them all for me 
I never saw its like before. I ne'er shall see its likeness more. It seemed like me to want a mate, but was not half so desolate. And it was come to love me when none lived to love me so again. And cheering from my dungeon's brink had brought me back to feel and think. Sean Barrett, reading from Byron's 1816 poem, The Prisoner of Shillon. So, if you were completely in charge of the school curriculum, Sigatomitra, I'm wondering where poetry or instruments would fit in as opposed to computers, which you'd presumably like them to have um, access to. Yes, poetry, music, literature in general, they are our human legacy. I don't want them to be taught, but I want them to be experienced. Available. To be available, to be experienced. And I would like a piece of poetry like we just heard to be told to, to children with no purpose in mind, except to ask them, so what did you think? I mentioned at the top of the program uh, the film Slumdog Millionaire and how it was inspired in many ways by the work you've done among the children living in slums in Delhi. It's the story of a street child who wins the jackpot in a TV quiz and who everybody thinks must be cheating. They don't believe he could do it on his own. And that's sort of your central message, isn't it, that even the poorest child has huge, unlimited potential. Yes, the, the central message definitely does uh, resonate with uh, Slumdog Millionaire's plot. However, having said that, and uh, I have said this to the author of the, of the novel, the end result of winning a million-dollar jackpot, that's not such a great objective, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I would have rather had a movie called uh, Slumdog, Professor. <laughs> <laughs> Music about storytelling next. Uh, Rimsky Korsakov's Scheherazade. You talked about the Bach as though you quite clinically, to a certain extent, listened to the music because you could hear the way we played it backwards. You could hear the music. And I'm wondering when you listen to something like Rimsky Korsakov, do you listen with the same attention? Uh, what does the music say to you in the way that the Bach said something about the uh, brilliance of the mathematics? I think I listen to music, and perhaps all of us do, in two different distinct ways. We, I think, start by listening with the left side of our brain. The left side of our brain is the one that controls our right side of our body, the precise side with its logic and sequence and everything. And then as we immerse ourselves into the music, the left side sort of stops and the right side takes over, which looks at it in its whole kind of way. And it becomes an intensely human experience.
The Sea and Sinbad Ship, the first part of Rimsky-Korsakov's Scheherazade Suite with Takuo Yuasa conducting the London Philharmonic Orchestra. Now, you were enticed over to Newcastle from Delhi about nine years ago now, presumably by plane rather than ship, uh, Sagata Mitra, to lead research in the education department at the university, and you've been living in Gateshead. How, how much do you feel at home there? Intensely at home, almost immediately, my wife and I both. I started off living in a in an area of Newcastle called Jesmond and then in Gosforth, and these are very posh areas. Mm. I lived there for about three years, and I realized that they had nothing to do with the environments I was working in, which were the schools of Gates and Durham, the poorer areas. And everywhere in these schools, the head teachers would say that, you know, a lot of the damage is being done at home. And I thought, but I don't know anything about this. I've got to go and see it for myself. I bought a house in uh, Gateshead, in an area called Felling. It's one of the poorer areas in, in Gateshead. Uh, these are old uh, coal miners' houses. Uh, very, very beautiful, mm. uh, really. But, you know, uh, unkempt. Mm. and so on. And I began to see the lives of the children that I was working with. I'm very popular over there. My neighbor actually said, a real professor, no less, <laughs> to me. <laughs> it made me feel very, very proud. So we are very happy there. We're going to finish with music, which I think you've been playing to your students in Newcastle. And they even beg you to stop sometimes. Ah, Brogue. Um, well, I uh, naturally living in Newcastle, I, uh, on the rare warm day, would go up to Scotland. And one of the first places I went to was uh, Loch Ness. I always wanted to see Loch Ness. You know, I wanted to meet Nessie, which I didn't. But uh, I went up to see Loch Ness on a beautiful, warm, sunny day. And in the bus, we had this um, very humorous guide who said, do not for a moment believe that our weather is like it is today. <laughs> this is a very rare day. And anyway, he started playing a bit of music. And I, I listened to that and I said, but this sounds a bit like Indian stuff. And uh, the words, they're almost as though they were Indian words. What language is this? And it's only later that I came to know that it was Celtic and it was being uh, sung by Brogue. I came back and I uh, started Googling a few of the words as I had heard them, and out popped Brogue, I bought the album, and I started listening to it, and my students would stop me and say, please, please don't play this rubbish, you know, <laughs> we'll give you better music. But I love Brogue. <laughs> well, it's quite interesting from the point of view of uh, being not unlike you, in that uh, they take their inspiration from Scottish music, but live in Zimbabwe. So they too have freed themselves from conventional boundaries. Well, thank you very much, Sugata Mitra, for sharing your private passions with us. Thank you very much for having yet uh, it's a great honor up she goes on an ocean wave down the search she wails oh sing away the chorus raise a royal prince he sails her